Control, darkness, freedom, music, secret bosses, protagonism. I have entertained all of these ideas and themes across the vast analysing I've done of Deltarune, arguably the core media this channel focuses on. Of course, these themes relate to such a significant number of concepts, characters, and central mechanics that I'm at the point where I've covered quite a lot of Deltrune without actually looking at anything particularly specific. However, in this new year of 2024, I believe now is the time to turn my ever-present gaze onto a distinct something, or perhaps someone. Welcome viewers, I'm Vivat Veritas, and it's time for me to try my hand at some old-fashioned character analysis. I admit I have a tendency to start at the big thematic picture and work my way down, so I think it's a good idea to try it on the other side. I recently, well, <laughs> not so recently now, did a poll on my YouTube community tab to see which characters my viewers were most interested in to see a character analysis on, because I love democracy. As it turns out, people agreed with the one I already had some ideas for, so that's nice and convenient. Out of all of the characters in Deltarune that we currently know anything about, Rousey is one that plays on my mind quite a bit. And whilst he isn't on the level of Chris when it comes to being infected by intense narrative miasma, I still think that it's worth everyone's time to have a look at him. Here's the thing. It's not just my interest in Rousey's role in the narrative, meta or otherwise, that motivates me to create a video about him. There are already enough good Rousey analysis videos around, especially by my associate Shadow of Roserade, to make sure that I'd want to do something different. You see, Rousey has a bit of a reputation in the Deltarune community, at least the particular part of the community I like to inhabit. Rousey is, quite clearly, incredibly suspicious for a multitude of reasons, reasons which I have made abundantly obvious in my previous videos. Whether that's having awareness of the player, information that only he knows, or an obsession with the sanctity of the path forward, he seems to have his own ideas that he only decides to share with us, or Chris, sometimes. I do think that it is quite important in understanding his character, and we will naturally be spending some time talking about these oddities. However, I feel that some people online focus a little too much on the lore implications, for lack of a better term, of Rousey, and kind of forget that he's a character in and of himself. Of course I'd love to unravel the mystery of Rousey, though I think it's important to understand who he is before we try to deal with what or why he is. So how are we going to go about delving into the psyche of the doobie smoking Mercedes Benz driving fluffiest boy? I'm going to break this down into a few segments as I am wont to do. The identity, the themes, the mystery, and the synthesis. All of this should come together at the end to give us a full, solid picture of who Rousey is and why he's important, aside from being a funny little guy to hug. At least I hope so. I haven't actually written that bit of the script yet, but I've got faith in myself. Hopefully you all do too as we begin this journey together. Join me, won't you? What better place to start than at the start itself? Rousey is one of the most integral characters of Deltarune, so it's important to go over the basics. Rousey is the Prince of Dark and the sole inhabitant, at least to begin with, of the Castletown Dark World, which eventually becomes my Castle Town. He acts as a tutorial NPC a lot of the time and helps you learn basic aspects of the Dark World, whether that is literal tutorials or expanding the lore of the world that you're in. It seems like he has a role in the legend as well, his title being mentioned by name, though where this legend actually comes from, aside from beyond time and space, is unclear. Speaking of which, Ralse is the individual who I would say holds more knowledge about the Dark Worlds than any other Darkner. Even disregarding his meta-knowledge like pressing X, which we don't really have a good reason to believe is an important sticking point at this stage, knowing about the legend, the roaring, and the darkness from other dark worlds turning to stone, is a level of understanding of his own existence and purpose more than anyone else. He really is a little walking guide. If only we could read his guidebook. Uh, we still don't really know what a Prince of the Dark is though. We obviously have King and Queen who seem to be the rulers of their respective Dark Worlds, but can the same be said of Rousey? I think it's reasonable to assume, as if you're the only inhabitant of a Dark World and you're also a prince, that probably makes you the de facto leader. He says as much at the start that he doesn't have any subjects, and depending on how long this Dark World has existed for, I do not want to get into Dark World history theories yet. 
that's a significant amount of time to wait to actually get to be a leader. Rase, unlike most Darkness, gets his power from the Grand Fountain. If you're going to talk about him, we have to spend a bit of time talking about that as well. I did go over it in the Darkness video, but if you don't want to listen to the suboptimal audio quality from that video, essentially there seems to be links to this Grand Fountain and Agasta through its existence as something darker than dark, in addition to the legend coming from beyond time and space, like where Agasta was shattered around. It's a connection made mostly through key words that only tend to come up in these particular situations, so the precise meaning of it could be a little lost in the Gasta mists, but I feel like there's a connection here enough to talk about it. What being in charge of the Grand Fountain actually implies could have something to do with Rousey's higher level of knowledge of, well, everything Dark World related really, such as the aforementioned knowledge of the legend as well as a level of awareness of Deltarune as a game slash program. However, Lancer also seems to know about the legend, though his perception of it does seem to differ a little from reality, and other NPCs mention things about controls and mechanics. It's entirely possible that they were just told about it by Rouse since he does seem rather familiar to people, but due to this I don't feel entirely comfortable using this fact as our sole piece of evidence to tie Rouse's identity to Gasta. It is undeniable though that his connection to the Grand Fountain means that Rouse is in some way more than the other Darkness, and his knowledge of meta-ideas reinforces this. Whatever he knows, he has the presence of mind to control. In terms of his actual personality, Rase is rather chipper and friendly despite seemingly being alone for quite some time. That's not a massive surprise as he seems to get very attached to the fun gang, especially Chris, even in the short time he gets to know them. He knows a hero and a monster are part of the legend, so it's reasonable to assume that he is operating under the assumption that Chris and Susie are here to fill those roles, but he still is incredibly helpful and friendly even considering that fact. He does act this way towards other Darkners, being quite polite and formal to even quite odious people like King and Queen, and pretty easily making friends with individuals who he seems to disagree with, such as Lancer. He's welcoming towards all of Chris's friends, and also any of their actions. Even when it seems like things are going off the rails, like after defeating Spamton, he tries to move on quickly and help people feel positive. I think this is a really big part of his personality. Rouse doesn't seem like he enjoys dwelling on negative emotion. He only talks about the roaring when he absolutely has to, but otherwise he very much tries to keep the mood of the party light. He tries to make things work when Susie is being aggressive, offering positive suggestions, but it doesn't quite work. I think that this is at the core of his character. Not only does a lot of his personality revolve around making people feel happy, but he also doesn't really know what to do when that doesn't work. It can even feel like lip service at some point. For example, when Susie doesn't want to try peace, he doesn't really think very hard about how to actually convince Susie that it's bad. He just thinks violence is bad and wants Susie to see the same thing without considering who she is and how to appeal to her. The same is true about the post-Spampton conversation. Rousey just tries to move things along because he doesn't know how to, or doesn't want to, dwell on negative emotion. Instead, it's up to Susie to calm down and help Chris, because she understands in a way that's different to Rousey. It even feels a little like toxic positivity, though I don't think Rousey is doing this purposefully to brush people off. I just think that Rousey has been constructed, metaphysically and perhaps even physically, to be a force of positivity that doesn't really have much nuance on how it reinforces that positivity. Rousey, at his core, is a video game character within another video game. He's a bit impressionable, naive, and caring, but the people around him not only seem to care about him, but are also quite hands-off with him. He learns through his new experiences with his friends, and has been undergoing quite a bit of personal change. He's less afraid to speak up and assert himself, he's more forward in his desires and ideas, and he sees hope and potential in Susie, Lancer, and others where he may not have seen that before. It's hard to say how much of Rousey's character development is being driven by Chris, as they're pretty hands-off and the choices that we personally make often have the same results, but as the lonely and sheltered Prince of the Dark, he's doing a lot of experiencing to make up for the unspecified amount of time he was completely alone. He's also got a lot of thematic weight to him. Let's talk about that. 
The thematics of Deltarune obviously have to be in conversation with each other when it comes to our major characters, and Rousey is no exception. As we have been talking about, Rousey is already associated with the idea of darkness quite heavily, due to his connections with the Grand Fountain amidst others, but what does darkness represent in this situation? Darkness has been linked to many things, especially by myself, but I think what is most relevant to Rousey is the idea of forbidden knowledge or mystery. Knowledge that is not allowed, whether by the narrative or the in-universe individuals, is naturally shrouded in darkness, much like Rousey is for most of Chapter 1, though in a much more literal sense. The secret bosses linked to Gaster in several ways all seem to have some kind of forbidden knowledge as well, and even if Rousey isn't linked to Gaster directly, his knowledge of things above his own reality ties him to this theme of darkness representing mystery. It's no surprise then that Rousey also has many of his intentions, ideas, and even identity hidden and mysterious. What we know about Deltarune characters is pretty bare bones at times, we know even less about Susie, but the problem with Rousey is that it's hard to infer things. We can infer that Susie doesn't have a great family life based on context clues, and we can get an idea about what she values and why she adventures based on what we've seen. With Rousey though, his entire in-universe purpose is to accompany us, to serve us. This almost utilitarian sense of identity will come up a little later, but because Rousey is literally built in-universe out of darkness, it makes it even harder to fully understand him as a viewer, which I think is super interesting. In universe, sure he's just a guy who helps the main characters and they have no real need to further interrogate that. For us though, as watchers, this all makes him incredibly mysterious, while still being totally normal in the context of the main characters, so that mystery is never resolved unless he wants it to be. It's a kind of dramatic irony, I suppose, that I'm very fond of. The way that Ralsei engages with the theme of freedom, or the way that it engages with him, is a little strange and a very interesting foil to Susie. You see, Ralsei is literally the character who tells Chris that their choices matter. However, he's also the same character who has very particular ideas on how the party should act and the way that the adventure should go. It even seems like he gets involved in particularly momentous occasions when things are about to go off the rails as it were, like intervening to stop Birdly making a dark fountain. It's hard to say how much meta-narrative awareness he actually has, but the point is that Rousey's character is being used to comment on the theme of freedom. It is not really freedom that's important, but rather the feeling of freedom being important that is important. Rousey provides the option to let you choose mercy or violence, which seems like a kind of freedom, but ultimately, regardless of which option you choose, you still achieve the same thing and the game does not change. So really, how much does Rousey believe that Chris's actions matter if he knows, or the game knows, that no matter what, the ending is always the same? Rousey's purpose in this way is to keep you on the forward path, and will do a significant amount of work to make that path forward successful. Rousey also has a large impact on the theme of friendship. Can friendship be a theme of a game? Let me try to explain. Although in a different way to Undertale, Deltarune is concerned about connection, whether that be emotional, mental, or mechanical. Rousey is also very concerned about connection as the fun little guy who guides you through the story, but his connection is more centered around the idea of peace and kindness. I mentioned earlier when Rousey says that Chris's choices matter, he is specifically talking about choosing mercy or violence. It's almost like he is partly aware that although the choices might not matter, it's about how you treat people. I genuinely believe that this is not a front, contrary to what some people believe, but it is also important to remember that Ralsei was constructed with this purpose in mind. He talks frequently about choosing peace and interacts with many individuals with kindness like I mentioned earlier. Not only that, he places a lot of importance in making connections with the other darkness, sparing or recruiting them instead of killing them. This idea of connection is where Rousey's interactions with Chris have a lot of importance. The way he interacts with Chris is honestly really weird. He does seem to have Chris's best interests at heart, at least, and wants to tell them that their choices do in fact matter. The problem is that he also seems aware of our presence through the naming of Castletown. 
or at the very least that someone slash thing is controlling Chris. A generous reading of this situation is that Rousey doesn't know anything about us, and so he's acting in ways he thinks would help Chris. The bit that stands out to me the most is the interaction with Chris and Rousey in the acid tunnel of love. When sailing down this picturesque river in the lovely swan boat, Rousey gets to talking about the adventure so far and how you're feeling about him. Rousey slash the game provides you a few opportunities to express care to Rousey in this situation, some more overt than others. The thing is, people fucking love Rousey, and I think that's very deliberate. Toby absolutely knows how to write likeable and unlikable characters, and every choice about Rousey feels deliberate to make us feel a lot of affection for this little scrungus. So, when opportunities come to express comfort or kindness towards him, many people leap at the chance to do so without thinking about what this means for Chris or the general state of the game. Like I mentioned in my first video, even if Chris is totally in agreement with these sentiments, who are we to control how they feel or how they express it? When talking to Susie later, if we choose the Rousey dialogue options, Susie says we sound confused, which provides a reasonably strong piece of evidence that Chris, unsurprisingly, is not in total agreement with those sentiments. Whether this has something to do with the information that Chris was given by him, the way that we've controlled their actions, or just general confusion as to why we would think of Rousey like that, it's still very relevant. Rousey, even if he is aware of someone controlling Chris, also seems very pleased about it. In fact, he's downright thrilled. People have mentioned how Rousey blushes when we stand close to him in the overworld, though he only blushes when hugging us if he's in contact with the soul. I don't know what the fucking implications of that are, but it seems relevant. This is even more salient when we're looking at the many, many ways of giving Rousey a hug and the proxy hugging of the dummy. He does seem to authentically desire affection from Chris at the very least, and this kind of intersects with the way he tries to do the same to others without much nuance. Rousey is receiving this kindness, this connection, and does not really seem to care about how it is coming about. I think it's also important to mention Rousey's role in the theme of identity as well. It's not a theme I've talked about very much, especially since it's very well talked about in the video by Roserade I mentioned earlier, but in the context of Rousey I think it's relevant enough to discuss briefly. As we were just talking about the acid tunnel of love scene, another piece of dialogue stands out that relates to this. Rousey mentions that he doesn't know what being a Rousey-like is, and this is where that point I mentioned of him having a utilitarian sense of self is important. Rousey is, fundamentally, a tool. He considers himself something like that, an instrument for the plot to use, and maintains that it's the purpose of darkness in general. It seems like he's beginning to question that, or at the very least considering what he could be outside of that. A lot of people entertain the idea that Rousey's physical origins as a darkner originate from, amongst other things, the headband that Chris wore to imitate monster kind. This idea holds a particular amount of merit when considering how interlinked Rousey's and Chris's struggles are with identity. Chris, who has constantly lived in the shadow of their brother, has never felt like they fit in as a human in a town of monsters, and is now being puppeted like a cheap marionette, has a lot to be impacted by and impact in turn Rousey, who may originate from Chris's own problems with identity and has inherited them with a similar expression of utilitarianism, not to mention, presumably, resembling their brother. So, we've got a bit of an understanding as to who Rousey is in the context of both the world and the narrative. There have been a few things I've mentioned though that remain rather mysterious about Rousey. At risk of repeating myself, I want to highlight one part in particular, his intentions. Rousey is not evil. That is a hill I am prepared to die on, not even in the context of him doing what he thinks is right even if it's not. I just think that the reveal of, ooh, funny NPC follower guy is evil the whole time is honestly just kind of trite. I have more faith in Toby than that. It would be like saying, ah yes, at the end of One Piece it turns out that the One Piece was the friends we made along the way. It's the most basic opinion you can muster as soon as you have a passing understanding of the media. Sorry if that seems kind of mean, I just think it's funny to dunk on. For I'll say evil truthers can team up with the third entity believers to send me hate mail, I guess. Anyway, the point is that whatever Rousey is doing, I believe it comes from a place of goodness. 
What I've already discussed about the way he works from a character point of view as well as a thematic force lead into this conclusion. His struggles with positivity don't give the impression that he's being subversive or lying to Chris. For example, when you're off with Noelle in Chapter 2, it seems like he has a pretty good time with Susie and even tries to teach her some healing magic. This kind of behaviour is generally innocent, but the main reason to bring this up is the fact that if Rousey was evil or trying to manipulate Chris, this behaviour would make no sense, or at the very least take a lot of explaining. It's like that infamous bit in Frozen where the evil prince, whatever his name is, smiles even though there's no one around he has to fool. What is the point of Rousey pretending he's a nice guy when he doesn't have to? It's not unreasonable, of course, but the same can be said about him building rooms for you all, maintaining Castletown, and trying to take care of Lancer. It's just so much effort to go to when he really doesn't have to, unless, well, he's just like that. It does seem, genuinely, like most of the time his intentions are just to help, or to make things feel a little more light. The point of him not being evil, however, doesn't fully clear up the larger mystery of his intentions. They may be well-intentioned, but there's still a lot of suspicious things that he does. Him not being a mastermind and wanting to secretly destroy Chris in the world is a relief, but it only narrows it down a little. If we're wanting to be more specific about the mystery surrounding Ralsei, we have to talk about... Oh god, he's here already. Yeah, BB, it's gust attention time! He's been mentioned a couple of times already, but if we're talking about Ralsei's intentions, I think it's important to mention Gaster, partly because his intentions are also very mysterious, whilst still being reasonable to partly deduce. Operating under the assumption that Gaster is the one who has connected us with Deltarune through survey program, it seems like he is a controller of this perspective to some degree. Check out the Device Theory by Molly Stars for a good rundown on that. He has also seemingly made contact with Jevil and Spamton with the said connection possibly being the reason for their madness, but his actual ability to impact the world of Deltarune seems limited. Only through manipulating others or forming connections does he seem to get the ball rolling, as it were. His deep connections with Darkness are somewhat shared by Rousey, as previously mentioned, but is that enough to conclude that Rousey is working with or connected to Gaster? Let's have a look at the more thematic point of view. From what we can see so far, Gaster's role thematically is one of a puppet master, the one who is interested in experiments. He wants the player to keep exploring this world and creating a new future with him. It's likely this intention, or this role, is about the purpose of a story and what it means to create or observe fiction. This is reinforced by Darkness's connection with fiction and escapism, and Gaster's pre-existing connections with Darkness. Gaster, in his own way, is creating fiction, and although I'm not sure if he literally created the Dark Fountain, I think he is responsible for it from a thematic perspective. Ralsei, on the other hand, is a creation of fiction in a much more narrative sense than Gaster. Of course, Gaster is hopefully not real, and is a funny guy Toby made up to make me insane. In the universe, or the meta-universe, of Deltarune, though, Ralsei is fundamentally a creation of the Dark Worlds. He was made by or from the Dark Fountain, a representation of creating fiction, to provide progression to the story in the universe. At this stage, his goals seem to be simply stopping the Roaring and banishing the Angel's Heaven whenever the time comes to do that, which is in line with the way that he was created from a meta point of view. Essentially what I'm positing is that if there is a link between Gaster and Ralsei, it's not a direct one like we've seen with Spamton, presumably. Gaster may or may not have created Hometown slash Deltarune, but he did most likely create Survey Program as a way to observe Hometown and the mysteries it has. Gaster may have even created the Dark Fountain and the Legend, metaphorically or otherwise, but I think that's where the connection with Ralsei ends. Ralsei is acting as he was created to do, but I don't think that there's a level of direct puppeting or advising. I think what's more likely is that Ralsei is aware of things that Gaster has done or created, like the legend in this situation, but not only doesn't know who Gaster is, he also isn't aware of anyone like that. The only point that kind of muddies that a bit is Ralsei's apparent awareness of the player, but as I mentioned earlier, I think this could simply be Ralsei being aware of the fact that there is something controlling Chris that he doesn't quite understand. 
Perhaps this is a fact, like the legend, that he simply knows through the construction at the hands of the Grand Fountain, rather than being actively told. That's about it. We're working on at least one degree of separation between Gaster and Ralse, and although there are some parts that don't quite line up, I think that's enough to solidify Ralse's intentions to a reasonable extent. What he wants to do and his intentions, at their very core, are motivated by his purpose to guide and to assist in the banishing of the Angel's Heaven, whatever it may take to get there. Now that we have this mystery and a couple of bonus ones along the way solved, it's time to pull out the blueprints and get to building the big picture that is Ralse. Here are the facts that we've established in this video essay so far. Ralse has a level of awareness of his purpose and existence above ordinary darkness. He is a force of positivity and kindness without much nuance. He has been made to be deliberately both loved and mysterious to the viewers while being normal to the characters. He struggles with identity in tandem with Chris and relies on them in multiple ways. He wants to preserve the narrative path forward and help people along it. He's generally acting with good intentions, but due to his personality and nature these may come off as suspicious, insensitive or otherwise odd, and he may be connected to Gasta, but they likely have different goals due to their different thematic and meta-narrative natures. These are all painting a picture that I'm intent on exploring, and I think if you've been following along with me so far, you might begin to have a bit of an idea where I'm going. All of this analysis was done to better understand Ralse as not only a tool of the narrative, but as a character himself. We've done a bit of both now, answering the who and the what, but now it's time to look a bit more at the why. At the core of Ralse are his motivations as a character, which of course is true of all characters. Even if we don't know a character's exact motivations, we can infer what they are roughly based on their actions and perspective. This has been difficult for Ralse in the past, as his motivations have been a substantial mystery. Until now, as my thematic vision has eradicated the darkness of mystery. What this specific intention, at least in the general sense that I've managed to define, means in the broader scope of the narrative, is a different question. Part of all of this is the fact that, well, Deltarune isn't real. Stay with me here. I talk a lot about Deltarune's construction from a thematic point of view, of course. It's kind of my job. But Deltarune is also such a specific piece of media, where it's constructed in such a way where it's very clear that the world we are examining, or the way that we're examining it, has been constructed as well, and constructed deliberately. It very much gives the feeling that we, the player, are real. And whoever talks to us at this stu- It's Gasta. It's Gasta. Okay? That we and Gasta are on a different level of existence to the other residents of Hometown. That's not completely uncommon in video games. A lot have kind of omniscient narrators or the like and break the fourth wall a bit. But what Deltarune does specifically is also have a construction within this world of the Dark Worlds. Ideally, Ralse is meant to operate as our steadfast companion and guide through the Dark Worlds, but this only really works if we're just playing the Dark World section of Deltarune. That's the thing, right? Ralse exists essentially as a tutorial slash cleric NPC in a world that is like a game to another world, but that other world is also a game. If all we ever saw of Ralse, hell, anything of the Dark Worlds, was the entire game, then that would entirely recontextualize his existence and identity. Ralsei would seem exactly the same to us as he seems to the characters of Deltarune. That's what I was getting at earlier. To Chris, Susie, and Noel, Ralsei is kind of a video game character, in the same way as Lancer and the other Darkness. They're all exploring fiction, and Ralsei is part of that fiction, much in the same way that Chris and the other Lightners are to us. What I am postulating here is that, essentially, Ralsei is to the Lightners what the Lightners are to us. And this is what his entire meta-narrative identity centers around. That is a fact that we can correlate through all of what we've looked at so far. Ralsei is a force of almost pure positivity that is concerned entirely within the operation of his world, and thus to us, who are purveyors of both the Dark and the Light worlds, it seems odd or out of place to us while remaining somewhat digestible to the characters themselves. Ralsei's attachment to Chris through dialogue choices, similar identity struggles, and protagonism affliction all stand out particularly to us because we are the ones who are controlling Chris and are directly affected by any actions toward adjusting or severing that connection but means little to the others in Deltarune itself outside of just being a friend. Ralsei's mystery is exactly that, mysterious to us, because he is heightened by the narrative as important, yet 
we are so unable to fully understand him. But the other characters of Deltarune do not need to understand him. He's just Ralsei. It might seem a little. Like I'm saying, Ralsei's motivations are purely because of his construction as a device, which seems to be not much of a character analysis, and instead exactly what I complained about at the beginning of this video, treating him like a narrative object rather than a character. I want to be a bit more specific about that though. That is Ralsei's character. Kind of. Ralsei's entire character is made up of the fact that he is a creation of the game itself, the game within the game, and what that means for both the world and himself. So often do we think or talk about how Ralsei will impact the story, what he might do to Chris or any of the other characters, without considering what the story will do to him. Although at the current moment Ralsei seems to be mostly going along with what he feels it's right, it's clear that cracks are already beginning to form. The other darkness, such as Lancer, Queen, or Rulks, don't seem to have that level of self-interrogation that Ralsei has come across, something that echoes ideas a little closer to those of Spamton, as worrying as that sounds. He's already thinking about what it means to be Ralsei-like, what that could even look like, and this is a perfect representation of what Ralsei represents in the game itself. While Chris stands as the protagonist and the themes of the game all bisect them like a terrifying thematic crucifix, and Susie as a significant character also impacts the themes of the world, these are characters who change the light and dark worlds through their actions, or sometimes through the actions we ascribe to them. However, as Rousey is part of that world, he naturally stands as a reinforcing element to those themes. But really, how long will Rousey acquiesce any role of action, remaining as solely a passive actor? That is his character. His existence being a fictional character within another layer of fiction adds complexity to the themes of the game, but he is at the crossroads where he needs to decide if that is all he wants to be. Just another character. I don't think he's necessarily becoming self-aware as being part of a game, as he's already incredibly self-aware of what he is and his purpose within the narrative. A further understanding of his place in an even larger narrative, one being puppeted by the player and Gaster, may be in the cards, however. Mostly, though, it's not so much an increase in self-awareness that I think is relevant to Ralsei's journey. It's a sense of self-discovery, thinking about what else matters to him outside the role and what he truly wants to be. Ralsei is a fluffy boy who wants affection and seemingly nothing else. The narrative, though, seems to be asking more of him than just that, and it's unclear if his hopeful and positive outlook on every situation will remain as the fun gang seem to challenge the intended path forward at every turn. Maybe, like many others before him, his desire to be more than what he was made to be may begin to smell of freedom. <laughs> We're at the end, thanks so much for watching as always. Rossi's purpose within the narrative is inherently tied to his characterization and vice versa, which has made it so hard for anyone to talk about in a way that either puts those into distinct parts or tries to take a holistic approach. The latter has always been my favourite, so hope that this methodology has helped you all understand Rousey a little more. I know I personally learned a lot about him and figured out my own opinions regarding his character while writing this script. Yet again, I haven't really answered many questions, but as there is so much mystery that still surrounds him, I guess I just wanted to get the facts straight and give Ralsei the credit he deserves as more than just a plot device. Hopefully the conclusion was interesting enough for you all, I'm very happy with what I've concluded personally. In other news, I think I'm going to take a bit of a break from forcing myself to make videos. Not that I haven't already been on one already, but I just don't really have the motivation at the moment and I keep feeling the pressure to make videos even when I don't have any particularly good ideas. I kind of forced myself to finish this video and although I'm really happy with it, I just don't have the motivation that I want to be able to really push myself much more. Not to mention that both my schooling and work are going to pick up again, though I tend to be more creative during those times so who knows. I'm still going to be streaming occasionally with the Fatal Gang, but I also particularly really want to stream or upload a playthrough of chapters 1 and 2 before 3 and 4 drops. Let me know if you'd be interested in that. As always, please leave your thoughts and opinions in the comments below, I always love reading them. A massive thank you to my lovely patrons Meggy, Zalgo, Michael Bates and Kayla Barker, as it's very nice to be able to have support while I desperately crawl at any scrap of Deltarune thematic substances I can. 
A reminder that you too can be a patron using the link in the description, and if you have any particular rewards you'd like to see, let me know. Until next time, I have been Vivet Veritas, and I'll see you again soon.